Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and I'm sorry you had to mention that I ran for President of the United States. <laughs> but really, after, after I lost in 2008, I slept like a baby. <laughs> sleep two hours, wake up and cry. Sleep two hours. <laughs> And I'd also like to ask your sympathy for the families of my home state of Arizona, because a guy named Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for President of the United States. A guy named Morris Udall from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Another guy named Bruce Babbitt from Arizona ran for President of the United States. I from Arizona ran for President of the United States. <clears throat> Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can grow up and be president <laughs> in the United States. So I ask their, for their sympathy. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you. This is uh, one of the unique places on earth, and uh, I know that every one of you feels deeply privileged to have the opportunity that so many people would like to have. And I congratulate you on being here. I congratulate you on your success. And I wish you every success in the future in a very unusual world in which uh, we now reside, a world that is constantly changing. Uh, and by the way, I'm also a, a little bit glad to be out of Washington because in case you missed it, the, uh, the approval rating of Congress is now 11%, um, all-time low. And I wonder if there's anyone here who approves of Congress because if there is, I'd like to meet you and ask you what it is, what it is you approve of. Uh, uh, we're down to paid relatives, and, uh, paid staffers, and blood relatives. Uh, it just no, can't get much lower. I, I was, uh, I flew in last night from Atlanta, Hartsfield Airport. A guy came running up to me and said, "Hey," he said, "Anybody ever tell you to look a lot like Senator John McCain?" <laughs> <coughs> and I said, and I said, "Yeah," and he said. Uh, doesn't it sometimes just make him mad as hell? So, uh, anyway. Uh, 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 we live in a very exciting and dangerous world, full of perils and opportunities. If I was here, uh, well, when I was here before, but even as short a time as two years ago, if I was talking to you, uh, Bin Ali would be in power in Tunisia, Qaddafi would be in power in Libya, Mubarak would be in power in Egypt. The Syrian people would not have risen up. And obviously, we have seen the, uh, the Arab world, especially the Middle East, go under, undergo profound changes, none of which that anyone really predicted. And uh, uh, the results are certainly not in. But the fact is that people all over the world are seeking and willing to die for their God-given rights. And in a place like Syria, which I'll talk to in a minute, they are, of course, giving enormous amounts of blood and treasure. Uh, I believe that the Arab Spring is not appropriately named, because I don't think it's the Arab Spring. I think it's a spring that is going to cover the entire globe. You even see some small manifestations of it in my own country. But when you have a country like China that is uh, ruled by a small group of people that meet once a year in a seaside resort and decide the future of 1.3 billion people, uh, that's not going to last. When you see Vladimir Putin uh, uh, becoming a virtual dictator, of Russia, that's not, that's not going to last. It, it, it can't last. And so the, we're on the hinge of history and how we react to the uh, achievement of people's hopes and dreams and aspirations, which we all share, uh, is going to have profound effect for centuries to come. Couple with that, a tectonic change in the world's economy from, from the Atlantic and Europe and the United States to Asia Pacific. All of these changes are taking place in probably the most exciting and probably also the most dangerous time in, uh, in the history, certainly 
since the end uh, of the Cold War. Now, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do believe that those who yearn for Mubarak, things were much more stable in. Those that yearn for things were much better and we didn't have to worry about these chemical weapons and other weapons in Al-Qaeda when Gaddafi was in power and on and on. The world was going to change. The question is, is not whether we could go back, which we can't. The question is, is how do we handle this change that's taking place and understand that there are some forces that we call radical Islamic extremism which threaten everything we stand for and believe in. And that struggle is going on as we speak. And I'd like to give you a, a late, latest example, obviously, as you know, is the tragic death of our ambassador and three other Americans in the consulate in, in Benghazi. I went to Benghazi while the fighting was going on. I know and love Chris Stevens. I went to Libya on July 7th, last July 7th, when the people of Libya voted overwhelmingly and rejected the Islamic parties. And we went down, after going through all the polling places, we went down to the, to the center of the city where thousands and thousands of people were, and they said, thank you, America, thank you, thank you. They knew who Chris Stevens was. So his death is even more tragic because of the incredible service that he rendered to the cause of democracy uh, in Libya. And so, that's it now, and there's a major scandal or issue in the United States about who knew what and when. Our ambassador to the UN came out uh, five days afterwards and said this was all a spontaneous demonstration uh, uh, caused by a hateful video. Of course, we knew that, that that was just could not be true. We are now finding out it was a orchestrated, planned, Al-Qaeda-affiliated attack with mortars, uh, rocket-propelled grenades, uh, and others. But the, the hateful video also did cause uprisings throughout the Arab world. But to blame it on a video is an absolute misreading of what is going on. It wasn't the video. It's the radical Islamists that used the video and spread it throughout the internet and spread it through uh, willing and cooperative television stations throughout the Arab world that inflamed the passions. So to blame it on the video does not understand, uh, is a misunderstanding of what's going on in the Arab world and that is this struggle between radical Islam and the forces of moderation and democracy and freedom. And, I, and I'll tell you, I don't know who's gonna win. But we should be on the side of those who believe that all of us are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And those rights include the rights of women and, 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 and people who don't agree with Sharia law. And includes the right to, for people to determine their own future. So we, we are in the, the most interesting times. Now, I understand the Chinese ambassador was here uh, last, uh, la at your last uh, gathering. Uh, I wanna say a couple words about China. There's no doubt that China is emerging superpower. There's no doubt we cannot have a confrontation with China, it's unthinkable. But we also have to understand that China is not behaving in the mature fashion that we expected of them at the time of Deng Xiaoping and the five uh, priorities that they had and that they would gradually become a more democratic and free nation. You, it's, it's not the case today. And they are bullying their neighbors and this whole issue of the South China Sea and the oil reserves that, <coughs> that are there, okay, if we aren't careful, can lead to dramatically increased <coughs> tensions. And what I'm saying is that the world needs American leadership and it needs allied leadership. The closest relation we have, of course, is with the British. And we need to work together. We need to stand together. We can't stand by and watch people slaughtered. And I'll end up, <coughs> if I could, by reminding you that in Syria today, a massacre is going on. 30,000 people have been massacred. And Bashar al-Assad is using tanks, artillery, jet planes, helicopters, and, and using those weapons supplied by the Russians and supplied by the Iranians, with Iranians on the ground as they are massacring 
their fellow citizens. I went with my friend, Senator Joe Lieberman, uh, to a Syrian refugee camp on the Turkish border. I met the defecting military guys who said, our instructions, our instructions are to torture, to kill children, and to gang rape women. I met young men who were wounded. I met parents <coughs> whose children had been executed before their very eyes. I met a group of young women who had been gang raped. And for us to stand by and watch that happen is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. I don't want American and British boots on the ground, but I do want us to supply them with weapons with which to defend themselves. And I do believe that we could declare a safe zone on the border where they could organize. Every single day that goes by, more Al-Qaeda come into Syria. Every day that goes by, more people are slaughtered. Every day that goes by, there's greater tensions on the Syrian border with other countries. You've seen the exchange of artillery fire just in the last few days between Syria and Turkey. It can spread. I'm not saying it will, but it can spread. And I'd also like to remind you that the greatest blow to Iran would be the loss of Syria, because then they would have lost their Arab client state, their connection with Hezbollah, and their ability to dominate Lebanon. So I, I grieve, I grieve, and we should all grieve, that these families and people who are willing to stand up for the things that we take for granted, <coughs> that we're not giving them the assistance that I think is not just a privilege of ours, but an obligation, and it's been our history. We went to Bosnia in the 1990s because Muslims were being slaughtered and ethnic cleansing was, ta cleansing was taking place. We went to Kosovo in the 1990s because Muslims were being slaughtered and they, in, the, in the heart of Europe. And we did good things there. We wish that we had gone to Rwanda to try to stop the massacre of 800,000 people there. And now here we are faced again with a situation which cries out for American and allied leadership. So I'd like to respond to your questions or comments, and I'm sorry to be a little bit somber about this, but I really believe that <coughs> this yearning is universal, and I believe that it's not gonna be kept down. I believe that with the Blackberry and, the, and with, the <coughs> with all of the means of communications that we now have, that it's impossible to keep people down. There's too many ways to communicate. I'll never forget being in Tunisia, meeting with the young people that made the revolution there, and a young woman stood up and said, Senator McCain, you know who our national hero is? I said, who? She said, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Believe me, Mark Zuckerberg. I talked to a young man in Egypt. He said, he pulled out his Blackberry, and he said, I can get 200,000 people in the square in three hours. They can't stop this communication capabilities that we have now this networking, and they won't be able to stop it. They'll find ways to try, but there will always be ways to get around it. I think you have seen the most <laughs> profound change in communication since the invention of the printing press. And this is a grand opportunity. I understand there are downsides to social networking. I understand that. But the upsides and the advantages of people being able to communicate with one another is phenomenal. So when I gave you a, a, a somber story about Syria, uh, believe me, I think we are living in an a, a rapidly changing world. I believe that more people than ever before in our history uh, look at the people in Myanmar today, as opposed to the way that it was not too long ago. Look at some other countries that are experiencing an evolution toward democracy and freedom. So I am more optimistic than pessimistic, and I also believe that uh, it is not only our pleasure, but our obligation to do everything that we can within our power, and I'm not talking about military, within our power to encourage and assist these countries as they make that transition. Thank you for having me. I'd be glad to respond to any questions or comments or insults that you might have. <laughs> and, for, and for our American students who are here, I'd like you to remember the immortal words of the late Mayor Daley of Chicago who said, vote early and vote often. Thank you very much for <laughs>